Hi, I'm Donna Laguerre with Appalachia Audubon Society and we decided to make this video today because um, well as a follow-up to the Doug Tallamy webinar that many of you probably watched and um, what I notice about every time there's a, a Doug Tallamy webinar there's all these questions about how do I actually do this in my area and how do I do it, how do I get started and so we thought we'd um, actually visit a yard in Tallahassee and pick a yard where someone has actually been doing this for longer than the Doug Tallamy books have been out. Um, so I'd like to introduce Rob Williams, whose home this is. Hi, welcome to our yard. And there's a few other people here, um, a, a couple of neighbors that are just learning, and my husband Jody Walthall, he may pipe in a little bit throughout. Also, um, if you did not get to see the Doug Tallamy webinar, go to our website, Appalachie.org, and there'll be a link there to it. So, Rob, take it away. Okay, so the first question is, where do I start? Well, the simplest way to start is with planting a tree. And I would suggest not planting just any tree, but plant a tree that provides important food resources to the birds and other wildlife that you want to attract to your yard. And as was pointed out in the Tallamy uh, lecture, the real critical thing here is, do, do the plants in your yard support a healthy population of caterpillars? Because caterpillars are sort of the engine that stokes the whole ecosystem of your yard. This is what feeds baby birds. If you don't have caterpillars, you won't have birds, ultimately. And so, the, I, what I've done in, for this little talk, we've marked some of the trees in the yard with the number of species of caterpillars that that tree supports. And your big champion tree are your oaks. In our area, they support over 395 species of caterpillars. This is a red oak. Um, this is a great... This is a great tree. This was planted by the city of Tallahassee under their adopted tree program. It didn't cost me anything. In fact, I didn't even have to plant it. They came and planted this tree. And I would really suggest that people making a start look into the adopted tree program. Every year they have a, a couple of different species. You want to find a native species. Oaks are great. This is a red oak. Over here we have a white oak. And both of these trees will get ultimately get very large. It makes a big difference what kind of tree you, you plant. As you can see from this, this tree right behind us, um, this, this is a black gum. It's a great tree. Uh, it's a beautiful tree in the fall. It, it'll have red uh, foliage in the fall. And that's primarily why I planted it. But it only supports 34 species of caterpillars. So you have to keep that in mind. You have to think about when you pick a plant, a tree, what's just going to be its function in your yard? Uh, it may be because it supports the ecosystem, the trees that have big populations of caterpillars. It may be because it has some other attribute. Maybe it only supports a few species, but are ones that you want to attract to your yard. A, a good example of that is the tree behind us. This is a prickly ash, also known as Hercules Club, or the Tingle Tongue Tree, the Toothache Tree. This tree is loaded with chemical compounds that discourage caterpillars from eating it. Uh, in fact, it has so much chemical compounds in it that if you chew on the leaves of that tree, it numbs your mouth. And so early settlers and Native Americans, when they had a toothache, would use this tree as a, as a cure to make the toothache go away temporarily. But one species is able to overcome its chemical defenses, and that's the giant swallowtail butterfly. One of the things I like to do in my yard is have a lot of butterflies, and so I've specifically planted food plants for some of our bigger, uh, more spectacular butterflies. And the giant swallowtail is the largest uh, uh, butterfly in eastern North America. Rob, I was going to, um, I notice here that you've got 
you left the grass while you planted these trees. How, Absolutely. How did you do that? Well, you know, I think one of the goals uh, should be you want to shrink your lawn. You don't, you don't have to have that huge expanse of lawn that supports little life. On the other hand, lawn is useful. Lawn is a nice way to walk. It doesn't take a lot of effort to maintain it. And so ultimately, I'd like to have just this little crescent of lawn here. And as I do more plantings, you know, I hope that this area out here all fills in. You want to have it, you know, if you want to attract wildlife, birds, particularly, you want to have it heavily planted. And so a lot of these things are going to get much bigger uh, with time. Uh, here, here we have a really neat uh, little tree. This is a chinkapin. It's a member of the chestnut family. And it, it, it does not get huge. But here we have um, hickories are a wonderful tree to plant in your yard. They support lots of life, lots of caterpillars. They're native to this area. A lot of Tallahassee 500 years ago was covered in oak hickory forest. Um, so we have a pig nut hickory and a mocker nut hickory. And I like them as a, again, they're a beautiful tree in the fall, beautiful golden uh, foliage. So picture this in even 15 years from now, even five years, these trees are all going to get really big and they're going to be casting a lot of shade. And as the shade comes in, you know, he could put some shade tolerant shrubs underneath. Or you could just have it with mulch underneath. Right, and those big trees are going to generate their own mulch because they're in the fall we're going to have a rain of leaves down. And I, I just like to be able to leave the leaves as a natural uh, mulch. We don't bag our leaves or ship them off site. Um, they all stay here uh, in the yard. Also, you didn't know, mention that river birch. I think that's an interesting one there. Yeah, the river birch, that's a great a tree because it's river birch is a fast growing uh, tree that that thing was wasn't so long ago that that tree was not very yeah. big and uh, it also supports lots of caterpillars um, so it's it's a good tree for your life and they kind of like a wetter spot so it's down there in the ditch which we get a lot of water uh, down there let's move to the um golden rod right so not everything in your tree, in your garden, is a tree or a shrub. Uh, probably the all-time champ for insects yes. species uh, in, in, in your garden is goldenrod. Not only does it support 82 species of caterpillars, uh, but also a huge number of pollinators. I've seen four different species on it oh. since we've been standing. Oh, yeah. Uh, well, more than that. I, I, no, I mean, just in the last... Five minutes. I mean, I just saw the, these little cute little beetles on this guy. Yeah. Too. But uh, now I didn't. Look, there's a long tail skipper mm -hmm. right there. I didn't have to plant these goldenrod. These goldenrod showed up on their own, and that's part of part of having a kind of a wild garden. I don't. Mine mine is not the most organized. I let things. If something sprouts up, I may let it stay, and and certainly. That's true with the, with the golden arrow. So, um, well, we'll look, look over here next. This is, uh, again, thinking about the function. You know, one of the things that I like to have in my yard are hummingbirds. We have ruby-throated hummingbirds in Tallahassee from about the early March until just about now. The hummingbirds uh, have already started... To, Last week, there were three hummingbirds in the yard. I haven't seen one today. So this is just about the time they, right. they leave. And so I like to have nectar sources for the hummingbirds throughout the year. Uh, this plant right here, coral bean, erythrina, has a beautiful spike of red tubular flowers in the spring. And hummingbirds really like them. Uh, another plant that I've planted for the hummingbirds and, and for butterflies, too, is uh, this firebush. It's, it's actually native. It's not native to this area. It's native to South Florida, and it, a hard freeze will knock it back. But that's a great plant to have. It blooms all summer long. 
and the hummingbirds were here every day, uh, uh, again, attracted by the orange uh, tubular flowers. Seems like the zebra longwings really like it. The too. zebra longwings and also cloudless sulfur butterflies uh, like it. Um, and then you, you have some other things here. This is, this is a beautiful plant. This is hearts of busting, or it's American euonymus. It has these great orange uh, seeds that pop out in the fall. Uh, it's, uh, it grows back in the woods behind the house wild, so that's one reason I planted them here. Um, a lot of your good landscaping plants are viburnums. And we have a lot of, we have a bunch of nice native viburnums that make great landscaping plants. And this, oh. this is an oh, okay. arrowwood viburnum. Uh, it, has, it has little panicles of white flowers that turn into purple berries that the birds like, uh, or blueberries that the birds like. Uh, this is witch hazel. Um, we have another viburnum over here, maple leaf viburnum. And in the back we have several other there's also a rusty black paw that way. This crab uh, apple is blooming. Right. <laughs> I don't get why my, that's a southern crab apple. Yeah. And, it, you know, again, another function, it's nice to have flowering trees. We have a bunch of great native flowering trees. You don't have to have that oriental plum or oriental magnolia. You can have sweet bay magnolia. You can have a southern crab apple. This, this is definitely a native. This was 10,000 years ago. The mammoths were eating crab apples <laughs> in the Osceola River Valley, uh, same tree. At 171. Yeah. <laughs> apples are related to uh, Sex, Szechuan pepper. Oh. This is very, and it has little berries just like Szechuan pepper berries. And has that, Szechuan pepper also has that mouth numbing. I was going to say, quality. there's a physicality to this. Yeah. But yeah. this, is, this tree, to me, is, is the greatest example of plant it and they will come. Mm -hmm. When I got this tree, it was a, I bought it at the uh, uh, Birdsong uh, Wild Plant Sale. And it was just a stick. It, it was a bare stick with no branches, and it hadn't leafed out yet. The top was just a tiny bit of green at the top. I planted it. And the next day I went out and right on the tip was the egg of a giant swallowtail. So uh, this, is, this is what I call my weed patch. It's kind of the ultimate uh, pollinator garden. Uh, for a long time, I had a steep bank here and I had a heck of a time mowing it. I had all kinds of erosion problems and I decided I would just let it go. And uh, what I do is I mow this down in January to the ground and then let it grow back. And it's a big mixture of, of Spanish needles, this white flower here, goldenrod, uh, melon fira. There's also spotted horse mint and a very nice plant. Uh, this is partridge pea. And there's a whole lot of partridge pea. If you'd been here a week ago, the partridge pea was still blooming and covered with yellow flowers. The partridge pea is a great, Here we go. Is yeah, a great plant. That. It's the host for four awesome. butterfly species. And it, uh, it also, the seeds are beloved by quail and, song, and sparrows and all that. So in the, in the fall, if I, this is a great place for the sparrows to hang out. They love it in here with the grassy uh, area. So. Think about just if you if you have the space, give something over just to wild, wild nature. Tell, tell us what you call this. Well, I call this my my tangled bank, and that's a reference to the last paragraph in Darwin's Origin of the Species. He he starts out saying it's interesting to contemplate a tangled bank with all the different plants and the insects flitting to and fro, and the birds singing, and think that all of this evolves according to certain natural laws and principles, namely the, the, the principle of natural selection and evolution. So uh, I think of this as a tangled bank.
Well, we mow it every year in January. Um, and if we didn't mow, uh, sooner or later it would be grown up in woody plants like this sumac. I don't want to mow too early because the hollow stems of, of all these plants here is where a lot of bees, na our native bees, live in the, in the winter time. So I kind of let it go as long as I can. But, you know, we'll get a new growth and then everything grows up. And every year it's different. The composition of the plants are, are different. But the key is he didn't plant any of this stuff. Well, he may have sprigged in a few things, but this this will just appear in your yard. And and uh, the goldenrod just appears. It, it, uh, the seed bank is there, usually in the soil, if the soil hasn't been too disturbed. I mean, there are a few things that it's for example, the red top grass there. Um, purple like top. It. Purple, purple top. top. Yeah, I mean, I actually did plant a couple, I just yeah. planted a couple clumps of that and it spread throughout. Which is, uh, did you plant the um, partridge pea? I don't remember. Because we, we, we planted it in our uh, butter. I probably did. And I it probably, spreads I great. Did. But I put I one in did. and you get lots of them. No, actually, I remember going out the FIPS and gathering a bunch of partridge peas, C5s, and mm -hmm. just putting them in the ground and then mm -hmm. scattering them around. Uh, trees and shrubs uh, come from the Apalachicola Bluffs area, and this is one of them. This is Florida Annis. And it's, a, it's endemic to that area. It has beautiful red uh, star shaped flowers in the uh, dark red flowers in the spring. And next to it, uh, this, this tree here is a wafer ash, or hop tree, and it, it's another food plant of the giant swallowtail butterfly. And you can see on the, on the side of the house there, uh, two chrysalises. These are giant swallowtail chrysalises, uh, one there and one up there, and they will emerge in the spring and start the new cycle for uh, giant swallowtails in the yard. <laughs> giant swallowtail chrysalis. So these probably fed on which tree? The hop tree. The hop tree. This is a neat tree that I really like. These, these, this is a hop hop tree, a Sona trilobo. And, uh, it, it's not that common in our area, much more common uh, farther north, but throughout eastern United States. And it has a very large fruit on it, it's about this, this big. Um, and they, they are semi-edible, I would say. Uh, it's the food plant, it's the food plant of the zebra swallowtail, among other things. Um, it, these trees have been here for, I don't know, 10, 15 years. I, Never had a zebra swallowtail. The closest zebra swallowtails are about two miles away uh, at Phipps. Uh, but uh, uh, sooner or later, a zebra swallowtail will come. Uh, in the meantime, I have had pop, the pawpaw sphinx moth. They're kind of they're clonal, and they grow in they they. I I, just, I started this little grove of pawpaws with three bare root pawpaws about this big and they they spread and they now they pop up everywhere around the yard so we have more pawpaws. Than, and this is another great uh, butterfly plant. This is woolly pipe vine and uh, it's, a, it's in the Aristolochia family and it, it is the food plant of the pipe vine swallowtail and it's pipe vines are toxic and so is the pipe vine swallowtail and birds the birds avoid them. There's a whole mimicry ring of other butterflies that imitate pipevine swallowtails to get the benefit of this. But uh, we raised a whole bunch of pipevine swallowtails this year on, on this vine, and it kind of spreads throughout the garden. In the backyard, you have a natural area. Right. And I, and I kind of like to have, originally there was a fence across the property line and a good piece of advice from Jody was to take that fence down. And we kind of, I kind of like the idea of just kind of blending the yard into the 
the woods. It, it uh, kind of makes me happy that way. Um, although, you know, this area here really is cultivated. We planted some wild azaleas, um, some hawthorns. Uh, these, this, these are, this is the eastern Meha, and, and behind it is a western Meha. Over, over in that corner, in the woods, we have a native a meha that they didn't plant, a yellow meha, uh, a yellow, I mean a yellow hawthorn. Uh, oak leaf hydrangea, another great plant, and this this, this is uh, ash magnolia. With the another, big leaves there? The yeah. big leaves. It's another endemic to the Apalachicola bluffs and, and ravines area, and it has beautiful, huge white flowers in, in the spring. This is a, a bottle brush buckeye. Mm -hmm. Some buckeyes there on falling on the ground. Uh, this is a uh, not to, not really native to our area, mm -hmm. but over in South Alabama is where you start to find these. Um, it has nice in June. It has nice big long spikes of white flowers. Another big hummingbird. Uh, butterfly attractor. Now, you don't have to uh, go with totally native. And in one area of my yard, I've, I've have some introduced species. So this area here is kind of my hummingbird garden. And the general rule here is everything is red. So we have the Turk's cap hibiscus, non-native. Back there on the trellis, there's a, a, a coral honeysuckle, which is a great native and early spring uh, 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 bloomer. Over there, there's a red buckeye tree, which has red tubular flowers in the springtime and, and blooms right when the, when the hummingbirds first arrive. We also have in here a uh, fire spike and uh, clarodendron. Canna lilies, and, and then this is a native, this is tropical sage, and again, this is one that I don't have to plant, it just spreads everywhere from, from seed. Can you point to that again? Uh, yep. this, this one right here. Oh, okay. You see a bunch of them over there, too. I see it's really pretty in the container, too. Yeah, yeah. So, so it makes a good so container cool. plant. This is uh, American wisteria. All over Tallahassee in the springtime, you'll see wisteria in the woods. But unfortunately, that's not this species. That's an invasive species, the Chinese uh, wisteria. Uh, the American wisteria is similar, very pretty, nice uh, purple flowers. Doesn't quite spread as aggressively as the Chinese variety. And it's the food plant of the silver spotted skipper butterfly. Now, this is where we have our bird feeder. One thing I, I would recommend to people that have bird feeders, uh, if, if some, somewhere nearby you want to plant a evergreen tree that has some dense foliage so that the birds have a place to hide and sit and then they can fly over to the feeder and back to safety. So over here, this is uh, Walter's viburnum, and that that's a very birds love that tree. It has little berry, little tiny berries in there, and they they can sit in that tree and eat those little berries. And over here, this is Yapon Yapon holly. Uh, this this is a. This is similarly, it's covered with little red, these, these berries, they, they're green right now, but they're going to turn red in a little bit. And the birds will be there all winter uh, eating those berries. At some point in the wintertime, a flock of cedar waxwings will descend and they'll take all the berries off of that tree. Yapon holly is interesting because it's the, uh, uh, its leaves have a lot of caffeine in them. So this is the alpine holly that we're looking at right now? Yeah. Okay. And uh, the Native Americans made tea from the alpine holly, 
which they drank before the uh, ball games that they played in our area. Uh, Osce <laughs> the name Osceola oh, means change. tea Perfect. drinker. Uh, this, these, these leaves were traded as far north as Iowa. Uh, let's see. So Other what's the tree in the back with the sort? Well, that's an oak, I guess, and uh, the oval leaves, I guess it's a white that's, oak. That's an American olive. This, or, this, oh. This tree, this tree here, American olive. Uh, this is a beauty berry. Uh, the, most of the beauty berries have already been eaten by the birds. Uh, we have blueberry here and some blueberries over there. Uh, of course, sable palm. And I think you were thinking maybe the sweet gum? No, the actually, uh, oh, no, the oval leaves. Gum. I was kind of thinking that kind of looks like oak, but no, that's actually an olive. Yeah. So again, I think reducing the size of the lawn so you have a place where you can walk and easily mow it, but all around the edges, it's just stuff with native, mostly native plants. Pretty much. And this, 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 other than that little strip there, we, we, we're pretty much native, back, all native back here. And I think the hummingbird garden, putting it up close to the windows right. is key. I always say, put, put those hummingbird plants right up near the windows so you can watch hummingbirds up close. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, there's can you also wrap it up with. Um, but maybe you can answer. There's also an issue of timing because right now we've got certain things that are in bloom right now, late, late summer, early fall. That, um, that's that's absolutely true. You need to think about that with respect to lots of things in your yard. Pollinating plants. Bees need nectar sources all summer long, not just now in the fall when they're. But also ready the to spring when the. Same thing with the hummingbirds. Flowers. They need a continuous source of food from March until October. Again, why do we need so many different kinds of caterpillars in our yard? Well, it's also the same kind of phenomenon because of continuity. All those different plants and all those hundreds of species of caterpillars are emerging at different times and providing food over a long, a continuous period. Yeah, the timing is that was good. I'm glad you brought that up. Rob, how about ending with um, a little word about the Red Hills? <laughs> well, we're lucky to live where we where we do. It's a it's a wonderful area. Um, we have a million acres of conservation land all around us, but we also have the opportunity to have nature right in our backyard. Nature isn't out there at St. Mark's or Apalachicola, it can be right here in your backyard. Um, I've had, I have dozens of species of, of butterflies in my yard. Probably, if we did a count, there'd be somewhere between a thousand to two thousand different species of moths in my my backyard. Um, I've had, I don't know if it's a feature for some people, but I've had five species of snakes, all kinds of amphibians mammals, probably um, 80 or 90 species of birds in my backyard. And you can have all this nature if you provide for it. You have to make the decision that you want to have natives in your yard. That's what's, it's the native plants that support the food webs that support all of that life. And so, uh, uh, you know, Tallahassee is still, uh, it's wonderful to live in a, in a city where there are birds all around us. Um, I have had uh, red-shouldered hawks and Cooper's hawks that nested across the street. We have pileated woodpeckers, Mississippi kites, wood storks flying overhead. Um, so that's that's part of the joy of living in the Red Hills. <laughs>